So welcome to Christian Restorative Justice 101 for Counter-Trafficking Professionals. What a bizarre long title. How did this come about? Um, well, my name is Mako Nagasawa. I live in Boston. Um, I am the founder and director of the Anastasis Center for Christian Education and Ministry. And our mission is to proclaim the restorative justice of God and the healing atonement of Jesus, especially as it's anchored in the early church, so that there's a really robust, strong, historical, intellectual, and practical foundation, because many of these things uh, might be new to folks, especially in the in the Protestant world. Uh, I I did my master's at a Greek Orthodox seminary because I wanted to understand how do they you know teach some of this material and and but in general. It, the the Orthodox and Catholic communities tend to be already familiar with this. It's it's Protestants who are less familiar, and so, you know, we we do a lot of things. Uh, we produce Bible studies, tools for evangelism, uh, tools to help pastors. Uh, just wanted to introduce why this class happened. Like, wh what was the genesis of it? There was uh, a few times that I I had a a chance to get to know people in the counter-trafficking world, um, some of whom are are right here in this class. And I really appreciated that, really admired the work you're doing, how how complex it is, how many, uh, kind of how, how robust the continuum of care uh, has to be, how many institutions you touch and things like that. And um, the the Anastasis Center focuses on early Christian restorative justice that God's justice is restorative, not retributive. And, and the more I talked about that, the more resonance I think um, we felt all around. And I was impressed that there was a lot of kind of needs for specific conversations maybe that happened or or to go deeper into certain subjects. And, and some of those needs came up at, uh, it kind of all along the continuum again. So perhaps, for example, if you are a survivor or a caregiver, um, you might, you know, be processing a whole bunch of other things, but as a, a uh, questions about who is God, how do I read the Bible, and how do I interpret uh, what God is doing in the Bible comes up, there's a whole bunch of things. God takes human life, for example. How do we understand that? Um, we'll talk about, did God distance himself from Jesus at the cross? How do we understand that? Does God play with relational distance? That seems like a mind game. And so for for folks who have had trauma um, or or if you're caring for someone, with trauma like that, those are those are those can be pretty pressing questions. In addition to just the ordinary questions that we as human beings ask, like, why are we vulnerable uh, to other people's bad choices? Like, what kind of God designed a world like this? So, th those are those are big questions. Some of which we'll touch on in terms of the answers. We'll we'll try to address like other answers that. Folks in the Protestant, largely in the Protestant tradition, have offered, but that um, I wasn't happy with, which is what I, which is why I and many others have tried to uh, look back at the early Christian movement and ask, did they think about things that, the same way, or was it different? Did they, uh, did they, could could they serve as a resource? And perhaps in Orthodox and Catholic circles. Uh, there's there's a stronger memory of that. Speaking as a Protestant, uh, Protestants tend to think that um, church history doesn't matter that much. So just maybe if you're Anglican, that is different. But uh, generally speaking, <laughs> that's kind of how it pans out. But but I think that the you know the the deeper we go into things um, and issues that are complex that uh, deal with human brokenness and the brokenness of our institutions as well, the the more we have to ask really hard questions. Uh, so, if for example, if you're in law enforcement or in policy making as it touches anti trafficking, uh, you might be asking, "How have we treated women?" Uh, what does that have to do with the the legacies or the influences of different Christian traditions? 
maybe Jewish tradition and Muslim traditions too. So, you know, how does religious thought interact with that question? And, and the more we look into restorative justice practices at schools or actual in the actual criminal justice system, um, Boston is trying more things like that. The entire Boston public school system has moved to a re uh, restorative justice model rather for classroom discipline and behavior management rather than a retributive one. I think, um, well, the results are positive, but I think that, you know, uh, provokes more questions in our minds, especially if we are followers of Jesus. Is, is the God that we follow uh, primarily restorative or is he primarily retributive? So, you know, it presses in these questions. If you, you might be a trainer for an organization <clears throat> and, um, you know, if you are talking about these kinds of paradigms, that there, there, there may be, I don't know, but there, there may be opportunities to talk to people either off to the side or, or maybe even from the front about different religious traditions and how they lend themselves uh, to either a restorative or a retributive uh, framework, right? And that might be helpful to, to understand because, you know, someone might be persuaded that, hey, a therapeutic approach that is strengths-based is really important, but that is uh, that that is more restorative. I'm not sure that the tradition that I come from, um, how it squares with that. And you know, if we're we're if we're only talking about if I'm so used to talking about sin, need, and guilt, you know, how do I assume that people change? And and so for some, it's going to be uh, it's going to take a little bit of work. And I hope that you can feel like I'm just a little more prepared to have that conversation. And and then for some of you, you've got churches and ministries that support you, and. <clears throat> God bless them for that. Uh, they, but you might feel like your relationship with them is getting complicated because maybe you, you're observing things or asking questions that they're not answering, or that the, you know they may be actually be in some general way um, wanting to help but contributing to the problem. You know, contributing to the problem of women being disempowered or. Uh, not not exploring trauma sensitive ways to minister to people. So those are some of the reasons that that uh, I have asked some of you to be here and, and this is kind of a pilot as far as an experiment is concerned. I've been really encouraged though, and I, I hope you have too because I think we've had really good conversations about this. We're getting into some really good topics. Uh, today, and I'll just say up front, there, there's going to be other ways to engage. I'm sure this time, this uh, hour and a half or so time will feel rather short. And so, again, the, the Anastasis Center for Christian Education and Ministry has the goal of proclaiming God's restorative justice and healing atonement. You could join our Facebook group. It goes by that name. Uh, look up our YouTube channel. And uh, obviously, uh, connect to our website. I will send these slides out so that you could easily click on the link and get there. If you wanted to engage with um, me or uh, follow me on social media, I have two Facebook accounts. Uh, one is my author page with my middle initial A and uh, my personal account where basically everything else <laughs> gets thrown up there. And then there's Instagram and Twitter. Really, really glad that you are spending a little time uh, together with us. So in session one, uh, we went through four different principles of justice and how they interact out there in, in public, but also in our actual relationships. And we made a case that God's justice is restorative first. That's the biggest principle and everything else kind of lives inside of it. Uh, they're smaller or contextual, and but there's an order. Uh, distributive justice is next, meaning human needs based. Like we need clean air, food and water, healthy touch, nutrition, you know, uh, 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 attachments and healthy attachment. All these kinds of things that would be, is what's called distributive justice, a need based approach to justice. Then there's a meritocratic retributive approach to justice, which deals with accountability for actions. 
um, rewards or punishments. And then there's libertarian justice, which deals with the question of freedom. So um, we did say, we think that's the order that we see in scripture. Uh, and, and how powerful that will be, we'll come back to that uh, next session. Uh, but we did tackle also an eye for an eye, that phrase in Exodus 21 and elsewhere, as not an example of retributive justice, but as restorative justice, which might have been surprising for some of you. In session two, uh, we also dis tackled the questions, why did God exile us from the garden and make us mortal? Why do we die? Why are we vulnerable to these things? And then why did God have an Israel and all of the things that come up because God protected Israel because he needed for Jesus to have a genuine human experience in order to restore human nature, then God has to uh, protect Israel and act in a restorative way all the way up to Jesus coming. So again, these are things that, um, you know, we were kind of exploring what are the ramifications of this uh, because you know my I and 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 my staff we're not primary we're not practitioners of restorative justice per se although I have uh, used these principles at my church or in other places uh, I'm a big fan um, and I, I'm not professionally in the world of counter trafficking <clears throat> but I think that um, you know the the questions that I've heard uh, folks like yourselves ask have, have been more along the lines of, well, how do we deal with these difficult questions when they come up? They have to do with the Bible. They have to do with spirituality. I had us uh, the, today uh, thinking about, you know, is God more retributive than restorative? And I had, I asked you to read three blog posts. They might've taken you five to 10 minutes each, hopefully not much more. Um, but I hope they they were thought provoking because they kind of lay out what the uh, topics are today. Uh, was Jesus the victim of God's retributive justice? And is divine fire God's intention to harm us? Is that how we uh, present God, that, that he is threatening? And I would love for us to discuss this. Um, what were your thoughts if you had one question uh, that you wanted to chase down, or the one thing that stood out to you, what would that be? The um, the image of the wax and the mud really yes. stands out to me that um, the sun or the heat element doesn't change, but the properties of, you know, the material that comes before that is a good um, way of thinking about God and how he offers love to everyone, but the way we receive it looks different. I thought that was really um, caught my attention. And uh, honestly, Mako, all of it was um, was amazing, but um, I really appreciate your work. It probably took you a long time to write these. You did a great job. I'm honored that you think that. The uh, What Samantha mentioned relates to what uh, many have called hu in scripture, as we read scripture, human being, human becoming that there is a theme that tends to get underplayed in Protestant circles, but it's really played up well in Orthodox and Catholic circles that we make choices that affect who we are becoming. And that it's that journey in particular that we really need to pay attention to. And it influences then ultimately, you know, like ultimately it, it is shown in how we respond to Jesus but uh, there is a reciprocal effect on us. And I think that jibes really, really well with what um, we are learning from neuroscience, what we're learning from trauma care, uh, epigenetics, the, uh, the effect of the environment on us and our brains. And, and it is just fascinating. So this is why I love Samantha. This is Kendra, because we had the same kind of thing that stuck out. Um, for me, I received it very similar as she did, that God's love is, is it's solid, like it's consistent. It doesn't change. It's, it's forever. It's reliable. However, we as humans are constantly changing and evolving and growing. 
and how we receive God and connect with God often spins and flexes depending on what we're going through. Right. Because we know he's present, but if you're struggling and you're in that mud, you feel like, where is he? I know I've been in that place, but he's always there. But when I'm having not in the mud experiences, I am embracing and feeling his love more present. I'm not searching for it. So that was kind of my big thing that stood out. And also, it was a wonderful reminder to me that he is consistent and I need to be consistent in how I feel about him, no matter how deep in the mud I am or not. Thank you, Kendra. I'm glad that that was helpful to you, too. Um, I just maybe a piggyback a bit off of what uh, Samantha said. I really appreciated that um, that bit that made it clear between the wax and the mud. But I and also I think for me, just reading these three blog posts today, it was like, oh, okay, these are the things I know nothing about. I am not a theologian, but I've had this such an unsettled unsettledness because the the way that I've understood God over the years um, has been it just it feels so off so I I loved that the that the, that I had some history as to why it feels off and then to come to the place where the the number four blog was like yes this is this is this says what it is that I'm that I'm I feel so deep within me, but I've got no kind of like educated or academic words to put to it. Uh, so really, thank you for all of the effort that you put into communicating this so clearly. I mean, it's it's mind blowing to me because it's stuff that as long as I've been walking with Jesus, it's not something that I ever really knew existed. <laughs> and I'm becoming more and more interested in history and how we got to this way of thinking and living and being because, uh, and now it's making a lot more sense to me. So I was overall impressed with everything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, your, your, your kind of um, uh, appreciation of, of church history also mirrors my own journey where you know, at first I was like, I, something's wrong, <laughs> but, but I, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to be like, well, I really don't want to be the first person, the first Christian to be saying something because that would be weird. Like the faith has been around for 2000 years. Like, why should I be the first? I really shouldn't. So to, to see, uh, yeah, so many um, kind of quotes that are able to be pulled together and and to reflect a uh, a consensus view on these things and and it you know it's just stunning i don't want to talk too much but i just want to say one more thing i've heard this criticism about c.s lewis that he didn't believe in hell and people being you know you get uh or at least i've seen two sides on the c.s lewis debate either people love him and quote him every day on their facebook or they don't appreciate him at all. Um, but I admit that I've read um, several of his writings and I really appreciate them. And I was surprised when people criticize that he doesn't believe in hell. And then after reading these, um, you know, these posts that you wrote, it, it shed more light on that. And um, it doesn't make me, uh, I don't know the right way to say it, so worried or something that I missed something about C.S. Lewis's theology that I should have caught. Um, I wonder the people criticizing him fall into the other camps that you've described in um, in the post. So again, I'm, I'm not trying to be a C.S. Lewis worshiper, but I do think he has a good way of um, showing a journey from disbelief to belief and then making it logical for people to follow um so yeah i just wanted to throw that out there because i saw a c.s lewis quote in one of the um posts yeah absolutely uh the people who criticize c.s lewis believe that god's justice is retributive that hell is a prison system where the the relational dynamic is people want to get out and be with god but god says no now lewis uh I mean, he was a medievalist, but he he, uh, he he studied 
early Christianity, he he wrote a prelude to Athanasius's On the Incarnation, which was written around 328 AD. And he he uh just loved it so much because it was so clear in simple language, and and he just commends it to everybody, but it also reflects where Lewis was coming from. And he was arguing, no, God's justice is restorative, not retributive. And so hell, I, I mean, if, and again, like if there are people in hell, uh, which we can hope that genuinely that there is not uh, on the, on account of, well, there's nothing in God that requires that people be in hell. Um, but if there are, it's because they have come to be addicted to to something else that has become more important to them than Jesus. Yes, thank you, Ian, for that comment. The Great Divorce is his kind of stellar, uh, very creative and engaging work on that. Um, you know, that that is one of the things. And, and by the way, we, we are thinking about uh, what to offer in the fall, like around September timeframe. And um, if there's enough interest in Reading Lewis and the Great Divorce, or uh, some of his thought, we we would consider that. Um, so, we'll ask for your feedback on these things later. But thank you for bringing that up. During this session, we want to move into the question then of like, well, how do we explicitly do ministry, whether it be caregiving, counseling, uh, pastoral work, or or just being a good friend, uh, especially to the most vulnerable, the the person you know, who's been trafficked, a uh, survivor who who has been through just really traumatic things and will have these questions that they're more sensitive to. So outline for today, I'm going to cover the magisterial reformers. So magisterial is is the word for magis or or it's it's the uh what the adjective for magistrate, the noun. And magistrate means government official in this context. These are the Protestant reformers who relied on government. There were those who did not. They were the Anabaptists, like the, the Mennonites, sometimes called the radical reformers. And uh, they are, they're just, I, I wish we had time to talk about them. But I'm going to talk about the, the reformers like John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Knox briefly, because they have a outsized influence on the rest of the Protestant world. So it's important to understand their political and theological context, because they shape why it is that we tend to think of God's justice as retributive and not restorative. Then I'll look at Jesus. I'll deal especially with uh, the cross. And one of the things that the cross Jesus did was he quoted Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And because of that, we tend to think retributive God is retributive, and he expresses that as abandonment. He forsook Jesus. Look, it's right there. It's in the text. And I'm going to argue that that is not the right way to read it, uh, and that it, it is, in fact, restorative. We'll have a chance to discuss that. And then we'll look uh, again at human destiny in order to, I, I think, help you feel more comfortable with the uh, the early church and what they do with the theme of divine fire in scripture, we'll look at that from a literary standpoint. Like, what are they doing with scripture? And then we'll talk about deservingness versus desire. Uh, what do we do when we move away from deservingness as the, the main kind of idea or the, the way we approach people? to desire, to be discerning about what they're desiring and what God is moving in them and stirring up in them to desire. And then we'll have some time to discuss. Great. So here we go. The political context of the magisterial reformers, they were regime builders. And when they, uh, and this is what I mean, the Catholics managed uh, the, the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, basically, and they owned almost all the land in Western Europe. So the reformers, in order to pull off the Reformation, had to look for capital, uh, money, for because they needed to print things, they need, needed to hire people, they needed to uh, study books, but they also sought political power. 
And so Luther, for example, was among the German princes. He sided with them against the German peasants in a uh, tension in in some tension that they had. Uh, Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich, Switzerland, now Switzerland, um, basically uh, built uh, or or contributed to the governance of Zwing of Zurich. John Calvin was in Geneva, also in Switzerland. And uh, he was kind of a, a conceptual architect that eventually uh, said we should burn certain heretics at the stake. We should set up a police state. And they burned Michael Servetus, a heretic, at the stake. So Calvin uh, was, he didn't light the match, but he wrote the papers. Henry VIII in England obviously uh, carried off his own kind of reformation within, into what now became the Anglican Church, Gustavus Vasa in Sweden, John Knox in Scotland. All of these are regime builders. And when you build a regime, like a, a political organization, you have to answer the question, what gives you the right to punish people and how? And that is something that they wrestled with. And their answer was, it's because God is retributive he punishes people. And so what we're doing is like him. So here's a great quote by a British scholar named Timothy Gringe in his book, God's Just Vengeance, Crime, Vengeance, and the Rhetoric of Salvation. He says they put a priority on meritocratic retributive justice ahead of other forms of justice. And he does this survey of hundreds of years uh, tracking church movements and their impact. And he says, everywhere Calvinism spread, and Calvinism be becomes kind of a shorthand. Uh, it is one of the most influential, uh, you know, Calvin school in Geneva sent out uh, missionaries and teachers, and they set up, like John Knox was a direct descendant of Calvin intellectually. So anyway, everywhere Calvinism spread, punitive sentencing followed. Okay. Or Longer sentences happened. They increased. The more Calvinism spread, the more people felt like people should do more time in prison. And that holds true in the U.S., right? Like, and it's it, and uh, studies have shown that the more uh, white evangelicals go to church, the more they believe in longer prison time, the more they believe in a preemptive strike on North Korea, the more they you know, 50 years ago, believed that the, the war in Vietnam was a just war. The Southern Baptist Convention um, said that they approved of the invasion of Iraq without being asked. It has an impact. Now, there, there's also a theological imp, uh, context that they were working from. Uh, Augustine, Anselm, and the Latin idea of merit became repopularized. So Augustine of Hippo lived at the end of the 4th century, beginning of the 5th century, and he was a prolific writer in Latin. He did not know Greek well enough to translate um, things from the New Testament into Latin. And so he made some serious mistakes that led him into double predestination, uh, the view that God predestined some to be saved and some to be damned. And because it is... It, it, that is novel. Uh, there, none of the Greek fathers said that. Um, he believed that there was one will in the universe, God's will, and so that that uh, belief is called monergism. Mon or mono is the word for one. Ergo is will. Monergism means one will, God's. Human will, negligible, doesn't count. Uh, everything we see happening around us is the result of God's will. So that poses a problem and a challenge. Now, the Catholic Church received that with debate, and uh, they uh, cushioned Augustine and said, you know, we prefer his earlier writings over the later ones. <laughs> so, but that, that that passed into the, the Latin world, and it was it was there for Luther and Calvin to pick up. Um, but before then, in about 1100, we have Anselm of Canterbury, who said Jesus came and died to satisfy divine honor, meaning no one gave God the honor that he deserved and until Jesus. 
So that's why he had to come and die in order to be raised from the dead. It was a satisfaction of divine honor. Meanwhile, uh, and, and John Calvin would take that in a new direction later. Meanwhile, the Latin idea of merit and demerit, right? How many of us ever served a detention at school or got a demerit? That comes from the Latin idea of merit or meritocratic justice or meritocratic retributive justice. That became repopularized for different reasons. In the 12th century and the 14th, it contributed to the Catholic Church offering indulgences. Now, indulgences was the system by which you could uh, offer a gift, like a financial gift. And really where that went was Rome, because they were building the Vatican and all these beautiful buildings. And they said, uh, this helps get someone out of purgatory. And purgatory now we think at, of as kind of a merit system. Uh, it was not that before. It was more an unknown. People just had to work through stuff. Um, and it was up to them. It, it did not have to do with God uh, enforcing something on them based on merits or demerits. But indulgences kind of flipped that around. And then in the meantime, uh, they had language about Jesus being a treasury of merit, like we can draw from him. So that is um, the the context of the magisterial reformers and why it is that they came to emphasize uh, retributive justice over restorative justice in God. Now, uh, colonialism also didn't help, right? Because in colonialism, what happens is, uh, well, let me back up. It, let me let me give you a contrast between restorative justice and retributive justice. Uh, if your cousin were to rob the the store on the corner, you know, like you you might say to the store owner, and he gets caught, right? So you might say to the store owner, "Look, this is my cousin. Um, we're really sorry, but he's he's uh, he's learning his stuff, and we will hold him accountable. Would you give him a consequence, like make him clean the store, or?" have him meet your family, right? Like all the, the people that his action would have affected, like have him go through that, make the consequences meaningful, educational, and restorative so that he could try to restore the trust that he broke. So that would be an example of restorative justice. Retributive justice is where you do not identify with the offender in any way. And you say, you know, it's just a lousy kid. He's gonna amount to nothing. And so lock them up, right? That's retributive justice. Restorative justice is what basically Christian love requires as we love our neighbor, even our fallen neighbor. <laughs> Colonialism is the dynamic where um, Europeans thought of people of color as less human, less rational, less reasonable. And so their approach to them was retributive. So in addition to all of this background stuff going on with the Protestant Reformation, colonialism has this particular psychological dynamic that emphasizes retributive justice. Some of you may know that the curse of Ham or the curse of Cain um, was, was invoked as if like, well, God is punishing these people. We're just like playing along. So one of the worst heresies ever. That is some of the, the reason why the criminal justice system in the U.S. looks the way it does, we, why we have mass incarceration, why we uh, took a punitive approach to, to women you know, who were prostitutes and so on. All right, so what about Jesus? Does Jesus demonstrate divine retributive or restorative justice at the cross? Well, I'm going to um, uh, highlight a few more of the shifts. Luther and Calvin tend to be the most influential. So what Luther said is that at the cross, Jesus became the person of Adam or David and so on, right? And that's in his commentaries to the Galatians and elsewhere. Uh, the, the earlier view was not that. It's not that Jesus became other people. It's that Jesus took a sample of human nature 
and defeated the disease that was in it by killing it by dying and then rising again with a God-soaked, God-permeated human nature. That is the resurrected body of Jesus. So it's like Jesus has a medical sample of, of human nature that has been healed. He did not take this the personhood of other play, uh, people. John Calvin added to that that Jesus satisfied divine retributive justice, right? And so that's why in the first blog post you read, then the question comes up of, well, how much of God's justice did he take? Um, and that leads to limited atonement. So here's an example. John Stott says in his book, The Cross of Christ, and he does believe in retributive justice and what's called penal substitutionary atonement. It is true and somewhat strange that Calvin, following Luther, believed this to be the explanation of Jesus' descent into hell after his death. What he's referring to is the cry uh, that where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, he believed Jesus at that moment descended into hell. Now, last week, I had you read a whole bunch of, well, just an article, and but the, there was a whole bunch of quotations of how did the early church for 1500 years interpret that? It was not a descent into retributive punishment. It was a descent into Sheol, the grave. Uh, and, and But Calvin changes the meaning of this. And he says, what matters most is the fact that he experienced God forsakenness for us, however, and not precisely when he did so. So John Stott fudges. And he says, well, we don't know exactly when Jesus was punished in hell to take the things that would have fallen on us, that God really wanted to give us, Jesus took it. When exactly, we don't know, but it doesn't matter. Notice the shift of meaning in Jesus' descent. Okay, So what about this? How, how then do I interpret this? How did the early church interpret this? This is called the cry of dereliction. And yes, I, I'm going to argue that it is um, it is not retributive justice. It's restorative. The, uh, the interpretation given to it is that the father somehow turned away from the son. So a broken trinity view. Uh, so that there, there was some kind of transaction that happened between the father and the son that was not pleasant. And the extension to that is, okay, so whatever happened to Jesus, then... God threatens us with that too, right? And this is the way that we minister to people. We present this as this is the dilemma that, you're, that we're in that Jesus then solves the problem for us. If, if it's abandonment, God is going to threaten us with, God threatens us with it. This is what we do. And again, this is, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of trauma-sensitive people would ask serious questions about this. Here are a few problems from a theological and biblical standpoint. The first one is, in John 16, 32, Jesus says, the Father does not leave me. So he says, behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you, the disciples, to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone at the cross, and yet I am not alone, and implicitly, I will not be alone, because the Father is with me. Notice that I, I think that's pretty solid that Jesus, uh, in particular in John's gospel, there's this constant theme of the Father-Son union, right? Like Jesus says, the Father is with me. Uh, I and the Father are one. And does that not last at the cross? Well, Jesus seems to say, no, even at the cross, the Father is with me. You guys won't be there, but the Father will be. And then another question is, where did the Holy Spirit go in that moment on the cross? Now, that's important because the Holy Spirit is usually associated with the being the bond of love between the Father and the Son at at the very least. So if that's true, then did the Holy Spirit depart from Jesus? Like, is there any evidence of that? Another problem is the historical problem. 
no early church leader believed that the father turned away from the son. If you want to chase that down, uh, you could read this book, Thomas McCall, Forsaken, The Trinity and the Cross and Why It Matters. So I won't bore you with quotes, but they're everywhere. In fact, the entire Nicene Creed rests on the assumption that the father and the son are one, always have been one. There was no broken relationship there. Okay, um, I'm going to run through a little bit of scripture and just things to keep in mind uh, when when you come across this, and maybe even if you're called upon to teach this. I think that this demonstrates God's restorative justice at the cross because, first of all, we start with David. King David wrote Psalm 22, and who was he? He was anointed by the Spirit to be king, but this was before he was enthroned. And so in 1 Samuel 16, we see that. In 1 Samuel 17, when he discusses Goliath, he says, uh, you know, when I was caring for my father's sheep, I would defend them from bears, lions, and things like that. So that is a new Adam picture, Adam amidst the beasts. G David was a new Adam, a retelling of Adam within an Israel which was already a new Adam and Eve living in a garden land, a new garden land, right? Like, so David is kind of a, a, a special example of these people. He was meant to be after uh, a person after God's own heart. And there's stuff in Deuteronomy 17 about what the king is supposed to do. Copy the Torah, the entire scroll. <laughs> like if you ever imagine trying to copy the entire first five books of Moses. That's what he was supposed to do, and and he knew that. And, and so he was supposed to be a, a spiritual leader, a worship leader. Uh, but he was rejected by King Saul, who did not give him the throne, and the majority of Israel. It took a lot of time, I think 13 years, if I'm reading scripture correctly, for, for the, all of Israel to come around David. In the meantime, he was forsaken to the Gentiles. There are many times he had to leave the protection of Israel and just go elsewhere. This was one of those times where he wrote Psalm 22, and he hoped for vindication and restoration. So he is already a figure of God's restorative justice because he's a new Adam. He's hoping for his own restoration, and he was, but because in the meantime, he was forsaken to the Gentiles. What else can I say about this? Well, in Psalm 22, David demonstrates that he was not forsaken by God. This was not David's own experience. He, he's, he was saying, well, God, why are you forsaking me to the Gentiles? But he is not saying, God, why have you forsaken me in some kind of absolute sense? Like the screen just went dark. I don't, I don't see you anymore. Here, you know, get a spiritual sense of your presence. Or, no, he doesn't say that. God was still accessible to him. In verse 9 through 11, he says, You are he who brought me forth. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. And then he knows God still loves and protects him. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him, meaning David himself. So David is saying, God has not hidden his face from me. There is no divine abandonment here. So when, uh, furthermore, you can go through a logical step. Another reason David was not forsaken by God is because God's spirit spoke through David. So in Samuel, in 1 Samuel 16, 13, the spirit came upon David from that day forward. Now, Samuel is written from the perspective of like the end of David's life right? The end. So as far as the author of Samuel is concerned, the spirit has always been on David. <laughs> that means something big, which was, well, Psalm 22 is in the canonical Bible, and therefore it's inspired. And if David was inspired, he was not forsaken because the spirit was with him. <laughs> All right. Why does Jesus then tap this song uh, because he's retelling David's story, especially David's pre-enthronement story. Why? Because Jesus's kingdom is like David's kingdom, 
and Jesus suffered like David suffered. So let's look at the first point. Jesus started off as an anointed king in exile before his enthronement. You know, his enthronement is Acts 1, where he ascends and he sits on the throne at the right hand of the Father, where, wherever that is. He's anointed to be king when he's baptized in Matthew 3 and Luke 3. Then he runs around gathering a kingdom, just like David did, gathering support. He forms a new kingdom around himself. Jesus even quotes David's experience doing that while he's persecuted and hunted by the existing leaders, right? So in Matthew 12, he does that. And then Jesus suffered like David suffered. David suffered at the hands of Gentiles. And Jesus's point is, well, how much more will the greater David suffer at the hands of Gentiles than the original David? Jesus is saying, I'm the greater David. Okay. So, uh, a little more detail. The, the quotation of Psalm 22 um, is something Jesus does for others and not himself. And this is part of his retelling of David's story for the sake of other people to recognize what he's doing. So he's engaging primarily the two crucified criminals and also, you know, the, the, the crowd that's gathered and mocking him while he's hanging there on the cross. Um, but it's, it is for the two crucified criminals primarily. Notice that Luke and John don't quote from this Psalm 22, my God, my God, because they're, they're not following that particular narrative thread. John doesn't narrate the criminals at all. And then Luke narrates one criminal's faith already. So he, it's almost like Luke is highlighting the effect, but not the process by which it happened. So what happens? Well, the crowd and the mocker, mocking Jesus, they echo Psalm 22 first. First, they're the first ones to quote Psalm 22. They're like, well, if he trusts in God, let God deliver him, deliver him if God looks favorably on him. That's the exact words of Psalm 22, 7 and 8. They quote the Psalm first. Jesus responds by recapturing the narrative. Right. So he says, I see, I know where that, you know, where that saying comes from. It comes from David. And David was forsaken to the Gentiles, just like I'm being forsaken to the Gentiles. So let me just underscore that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me to the Gentiles? And Jesus is saying, and aren't, am I not the greater David? If David went through this, to get to his throne? Don't I need to go through this to get to my throne? So he's recapturing the narrative. And so Jesus was not abandoned by the Father, looking at it from the lens of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit spoke through Jesus to retell David's story. The Spirit helped the Son kill the sinfulness in himself through death. That's Romans 8, verse 3, and 6, verse 6. The Father was with the Son even though the disciples abandoned Jesus. John 16, 32. And the entirety of Matthew's gospel is a chiasm. A chiasm is where the first point matches the last point, second point matches second last point, and so on, until you get to the center. The center is a turning point or the main point. The relevant portions here are B and C, and C prime and B prime. So in B, when Jesus... Uh, is baptized, his role as king un, um, is stressed. He, the Magi acknowledge him as king. He's rejected by Herod because Herod wants to be a king. And so even as a kid, that's how Jesus is presented, as a baby. And then in C, uh, he Jesus overcomes three temptations in the wilderness. Da, 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 da. And we get to the other side of Matthew's gospel, in C prime, Jesus overcomes three temptations in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Notice the symmetry, three temptations. And Peter fails three times, which if we had more time, I would talk about that. That matches C. So C prime matches C. B prime matches B. 
The stress is Jesus as king. As he's on the cross, he's rejected by both Jewish and Gentile leaders. The, one of the Roman centurions says, surely this is the son of God. That's a title about being a king. And, and then he dies. Because baptism and death are related, right? When you're baptized, you he, he went under signifying death, came up signifying resurrection. So there's a strong symmetry here. The main point being God's spirit is with him the whole time. He was anointed to do precisely this thing. So when we look at Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have to conclude this. Jesus retold David's pre-enthronement story. Why? Because David messed up. He wasn't perfect. And, and he had a role to play, just like Israel had a role to play as the medical focus group. But they couldn't internalize fully the, the health regimen. No one could. And so God had to come into the focus group, take up these roles, and perfect the cure in himself by becoming a patient. So he fulfilled David's story and Israel's story. He filled it to overflowing, not just fulfilling kind of like the, well, the, the kind of bare minimum of what David should have done, but actually becoming so much more. And the implication is that God in Christ repairs and restores our own failings and shortcomings. Tell me that's not relevant to someone who wrestles with their failings and shortcomings, right? Or even the things that have happened to them, where they think, oh, this is, this is what has defeated me. Well, God in Christ comes in and lifts that story up and restores it. And so the Father did not abandon the Son. John 16, 32 stands. The Nicene Creed of the Father and Son being united stands. And the implication for us doing ministry is God does not use abandonment as retribution. That's not what's lurking in the background. So here's some discussion questions. Which practical application should we draw from Jesus and Psalm 22? And notice these aren't exactly um, opposites, but in an emotional sense, they they go almost 180 degrees in different directions, right? Number one is the penal retributive view. God the Father was distancing himself relationally from Jesus because Jesus suffered what we deserve. Or the medical restorative view. God in Christ comes into our stories to fulfill them and fill them to overflowing because he loves us. And he wants to retell our stories with us, with our partnership. So that's number one. And, and then please do think about uh, question number two. How would you motivate other people towards Jesus if you could not use abandonment and retribution as divine threats? Let's talk about this. So I think definitely um, love would have to play part of the motivation. Uh, if you did not have, it would it would be something that is attractive and drawing people towards you instead of a, a, a forcing people towards you through retribution or coercing people towards you. Like fulfillment, you know, a life that's fulfilling, a purpose that's fulfilling in addition to love. I think, Mako, what would motivate people towards Jesus. As a therapist, I think a lot um, about, well, I think a lot about the model of object relations and taking in, interjecting um, a good enough mother, a good enough caregiver. And when that can happen, then baby can develop into a sense of him or herself and so what what we're bringing here with restorative seems so much to line up with that where it you know and, and so yes we're talking about a caregiver but what if we also at the same time talked about the love of God and so if 
if a child or a, a woman that I sit with who's been trafficked is able to um, take begin to take me in, then can she take in Jesus? And 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 when I say take in, it means intrapsychically, so into her both her conscious mind, but into her unconscious mind, and so it becomes ontologically part of her. Thank you, Corinne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the second question is a very powerful question. How do you motivate other people towards Jesus? And for me, it goes back to what my mom would tell my sister and I every single morning on the way to school is allow his light to reflect through you. Be open for that. And I, as you know, when you're a kid, you're just like, okay, but I think it's true because when you are working with trafficking survivors, many of them are or were believers and they run from the church because there's so much judgment. You're dirty, you're different, you're this, you're not that, look at how you're dressed. And I think sometimes it, it just needs to be a reflection and, and it brought to mind, um, I was working with a survivor, <clears throat> excuse me, she wanted to go to church. Okay, let's go. And she put on what she had, which looked like her street clothes. And I wasn't going to judge her for it because I'm just not going to do that. that. Because then if I do that, I'm turning her away. And so when we walked on the grounds of the church, she says, she stopped and she says, I can't go in there. And I said, why? She goes, look at how I look. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, I can't go in like that. And I said, okay, let me see what I can do. And this was not my church, but I found a person affiliated with the church. And I said, I have this beautiful client who would, this beautiful young lady who would like to go to church, but she is concerned about her attire. And that woman who I didn't know reflected Jesus in one of the greatest ways. She looked at the client, at my client and she said, come with me. And she walked us in a trailer that had racks and racks and racks of clothes. And she said, pick what you want. This is our donation center. She didn't judge her. She didn't look at her in disgust. She didn't have a negative comment. Pick what you want. And that, I watched this young lady's face just fill with like joy because I think what people forget is that victims of trafficking do have a sense of shame. A lot of them do. And we, as the church, often shame them more. But this woman didn't. And so sometimes I think it's not always a conversation, but it's an action. And how do you show up? And when you show up and they know you're a person of faith, everyone I work with knows Kendra and Jesus are best friends. I think I'm his favorite. I super love him and he super loves me. And because they just know that about me and I treat you a certain way, it makes them ask questions about him and they want to know more about him. And does he love me because I think I might be gay? Does he love me because I have been forced to sell myself or I chose to sell myself, whatever it is they think? And my answer is, I don't know anyone who he doesn't love. And from there, we can start having a conversation that's based on that. But I know a lot of faith-based groups will come and work with our kids and they want to lay hands on them and do all kinds of stuff that is an uncomfortable space for them. And it, it, or say something that may make you feel as if you are not to be accepted by God. So sometimes I think it's reflection. What do you show? That's right. And, and um, part of what you're doing, and thank you so much, Kendra, part of what I uh, think you're doing is you're demonstrating a real curiosity about who she is, right, or who they are at any given point in, in your relationship with them, which is different from someone who says, I really don't need to know your story at all, right? Like, because I could just pray, or you could just pray, or you just show up and hear something that I say or someone else says, and your response to that is all that matters, right? Like, let me tell you about Jesus and blah, blah, blah. But, but it's, and 
part of where that comes from, again, is Augustine. Augustine thought that our, our sinfulness was so deep that there's nothing left of the image of God in us. And so there's nothing left to discover. So, and the, the real implication is, is shown when we say to, or we think to a non-Christian, I don't really need to know your story because I can tell God is not at work at all until I showed up, right? So, the, but the reality is <laughs> God is always pursuing every single person because we're made in his image. He never gives up. He's always pursuing in some form. There are always certain desires that are percolating up in us, in people, um, that we're going to see as, oh, that's connected to God. Like that person desires healing, desires goodness, desires connection, desires justice. Yes. Where do those desires come from? And he is a God of forgiveness. There's nothing he won't forgive us for. So when we know that, why do some act so pious as, or as if they are so much better than someone else because the sin they committed might be different? And that's sort of the struggle I see a lot with those um, I work with in a lot of the question, well, if there was a God, Kendra, why did this happen to me? Why did my uncle rape me or whatever? And I said, if there wasn't a God, you wouldn't be here because he sustained you through it. Now let's talk about how he did that and what we're going to do with it. Yeah. And I find so many people so for lack of a better word, preachy and just so purely judgmental. And it's not their intent. Their intent is good. Yeah. And they mean well, but they don't understand how they just wrote. I've seen kids and people just literally repel because of how it's brought to them. And it's exactly how you said it. Thank you for letting me share. Absolutely. Can I just respond to that? Also, um, I'm working with and around a lot of mission organizations and I think there is a, a real danger that it's like you're providing care with the proviso that I'm doing this for you so that you will come to faith and that, that it's not a freely given it's like an obligation and then that becomes pressure on somebody because they're not feeling like you're really doing this to help me it's like only if you if I fit into your box and your paradigm number one number second comment to respond to both of you is attachment theory I just think God doesn't abandon um so relates to attachment theory and and you know mother child object relations and that God is a steady constant of, of like object relation if you didn't have that and that in the model of of him with Jesus with with what you were discussing you know, he doesn't abandon. And so where people have failed and systems have failed, you know, God doesn't fail. So. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, absolutely. Attachment theory and atonement theology are really important to kind of put together. Ian, um, you were, looked like you were going to say something. I, yeah, I just wanted to throw in um, uh, something that Ken, Kendra's comment kind of brought up for me is, is this idea of this, like this judgment. And, and I think somebody else in the chat had said, uh, had shared a story about someone being, you know, thrown out of a person's car when they had said that they were part of the sex industry. And I think that there, there is such a, a tendency in the evangelical church to kind of think about like, oh, what are like the things that I need to reject from the culture? Like there's this, uh, there's this like fear that like, oh, the outside culture is going to like infect me or is going to infect our church or something like that. Um, you know, and, and that is, uh, 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 you know, a thought that a lot of ancient cultures had and, and certainly like different cultures have nowadays, but like, it's crazy that Jesus totally flips that script that, you know, he is the one that like goes to the lepers. It's not like he's like, oh, I need to like stay away. And because I don't want to be infected, it's like, he's like, no, I'm actually the one who's going to do the infecting <laughs> for lack of a better term, like with my health, with my healing, with my restoration, like I'm going to bring wholeness uh, in, in an infectious way into this broken situation. And yeah, I wish that the church would, would, uh, would, would model that a little bit more. <laughs> mm, thank you, Ian. Yeah. I, I did want to give my last piece and and then have us discuss because I think that would tie up a loose end. 
So I want to come back to the question of human destiny. We've been we we raised this last time. It's appropriate to talk about it here. Is God really uh, restorative and not retributive? Uh, you know, it's easy to see that in what we call heaven um, or the new heavens, new earth. But what about the flip side? The what is called hell or the lake of fire or um, the <laughs> What is the TV show, The Good Place? What, is, what do they call that? The bad place? Um, the flip side of it. So I, I, you know, this this kind of probably, I, I hope will help you understand why the early church um, read divine fire as being about res restoration. It was God's attempt and invitation to restore us and purify us, kind of like, a refiner's fire would melt down precious metals so that the dross would uh, come to the top and be able to be scooped out. So uh, again, I, this is just one example, uh, but as a refresh, Ambrose of Milan in the fourth century uh, talks about Isaiah, shows that the Holy Spirit is not only light, but also fire, saying the light of Israel shall be for a fire. Uh, and then talks about the coal, right? Like, why is that significant? Because Isaiah's coal touched him and it was cleansing to his tongue. He could speak the words of God then. Like it was about fire, it was about purification, restoration, refinement. Ambrose continues, for our God is a consuming fire, as Moses said, for the bush was burning, was but was not consumed, because in that mystery, the Lord was showing that he would come to illuminate the thorns of our body, and not to consume those who were in misery, but to alleviate their misery, who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire that you might give grace and destroy sin. What then is that fire? That fire which improves good deeds like gold and consumes sins like stubble. This is undoubtedly the Holy Spirit who is called both the fire and light of the countenance of God. And as there is a light of the divine countenance like the face of God, so too does fire shine forth from the countenance of God. For it is written, a fire shall burn in his sight. For the, day, the grace of the day of judgment shines beforehand. Isn't that interesting? He speaks of the day of judgment as the grace of the day of judgment shines beforehand. That forgiveness may follow to reward the service of the saints. So, uh, how does he get there? Well, he what what they are doing is reading the Bible thematically. Um, uh, I think there's if you're like me, you you were trained to read the Bible not necessarily thematically. Like you you would read it like a slideshow. Like you know you do your quiet time one day, you read one chapter, and then the next day the next, and but not so much that you put it together. And, and so what happens when we put uh, entire books together? Well, the first instance of fire starts like this. Outside the garden, God stationed a fiery sword with cherubim, right? And basically the idea is God wants us to come back to the garden, but if we are going to come back, we have to agree that God can cut something away from us or burn something away from us that shouldn't be there. That We talked about that last week. Uh, and so, yes, the second instance is the flaming torch. Now, there is fire when, you know, there's the fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. I'll come back to that in the book of Revelation when we talk about that. But essentially, the flaming torch is with Abraham, and it cuts a covenant, and it gives light and purity. So the next instance was the, or major instance, was the bush the burning bush, and sure, we can see God in the burning bush, okay, um, but it is powerful because it's an image of us, and and then God says to Moses, come back here, bring all Israel with you, and when he does, God descends on Mount Sinai in fire, and so the whole mountain lights up. The Lord descended upon it in fire, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up, and he also said, hey, Israel, I want all of you to come up here. And they say, no, <laughs> we, we don't want to do that. So you take Moses instead. And God says, all right, Moses will come up here. Um, and, and so the fire on Mount Sinai was an invitation to Israel to be refined. They said no. 
And God, God said, all right, Moses will come up and I will shine through his face, right? Like the, the goal, what happens to Moses is he's purified in some sense. He's refined. He is restored to what human, Adam and Eve should have always been. There's light coming from his face because there's light that comes from God's face. And then that whole, the Mount, Mount Sinai is kind of becomes a model or replicated in the sanctuary, the tabernacle, where the fire of God, like the Holy of Holies is the top. The holy place is second. That's the middle. The courtyard is the bottom, the base of the mountain. And so when the high priest goes in um, every year, it is a retelling of the story of Moses going up. And so what happens? There's a fire in the bronze altar that made holy everything that touched it, because that is what you have to pass to get through. And it makes you holy, just like Jesus made everything uh, whole or healed. Isaiah takes a, uh, God takes a coal from that altar, that altar, that very one, and touches his Isaiah's lips with it. And th that becomes a whole theme in Isaiah. And the earliest liturgy of the church, called the Liturgy of St. James, from Jeru the Jerusalem church, calls the Eucharist a fiery coal, meaning as we take in the body and blood of Jesus, we're supposed to think of purification. Cool, huh? So all throughout um, these books, uh, Malachi especially talks about a refining fire. There's a whole bunch of other references. I'll leave you to chase down on the slides later. Uh, Matthew's gospel uses this motif, fire, the Holy Spirit and fire, and how we experience that fire depends on us. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus, and you know, uh, and so he's anointed. And when he walks around Galilee, it says, "Those in Galilee are seeing a great light." And that light becomes visible when the Spirit transfigures him on the mountain in Matthew seventeen. And then later on another mountain, he's in resurrection glory, and he commissions his his disciples to baptize with his teaching. So that fire is with us. And that's a mosaic from the fifth century of Jesus' transfiguration. How powerful is that? Um, of course, you, you might, I want to tie up a few questions that how you experience divine fire depends on you in a positive sense. So when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill, he's thinking of the temple with with the, the light of the world that would have been in it. But Jesus is now saying, you are that. You are my temple. I am in you. And then these oil lamps become a metaphor in the parable in Matthew 25 for light and fire. Um, but also fire can be experienced negatively. Uh, Jesus says, you might be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell or throw them into the furnace of fire. He also says, throw them into the outer darkness. Throw that person into the outer darkness. Why? It's because when the Israelites, because fire and darkness are a motif of Mount Sinai from the outside, from the perspective of people who said no. So the Israelites said no when God said, come up. Moses went up. He went through the fire and his face shone. The Israelites were at the base. What did they see? Fire and darkness, right? In Deuteronomy 4, you came near, stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick gloom. But you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up the mountain. So fire and darkness is a way of expressing, yeah, you had the chance to go up the mountain, and you didn't. You didn't meet with God. So. Uh, it's, it feels negative to you. Of course, Pentecost comes with fire, the tongues of fire that sit on every person's head. Pentecost is a commemoration of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. So every believer becomes a miniature Mount Sinai. And again, how you experience divine fire depends on you. That's Pentecost. Beautiful. Uh, Paul says fire can strengthen, can burn away uh, wood, hay, and stubble but it can strengthen uh, gold and precious stones. And Revelation starts with a vision of Jesus as the fiery one, 
His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And look at his feet. They're like burnished bronze, which is heated in the fire. Uh, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, meaning his word is what cuts things away from us. So, oh, so Jesus is that fiery sword that was stationed outside the garden. God wants us to come back to the garden. But Jesus is the fiery sword. He needs to burn something away and cut something away from us in order for us to return. So fire is a good thing, even though we could resist it. And uh, Revelation uh, shows that. So, for example, there are those who reject Jesus and they're tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Notice not in the absence of the lamb, the presence. Why? Because he's the fiery one. <clears throat> the New Jerusalem, uh, the, the people of God are described like a city made out of pure gold, like transparent glass, which is kind of confusing, right? Because pure gold is not transparent, like transparent glass, except in the sense that they have been refined by fire. Right, that's what pure pure gold and transparent glass have in common. And so, yes, there is a lake of fire, and I have these notes about the lake being a reversal of, you know, it's like uh, instead of sea surrounding land as it was in Genesis one, you have land surrounding water or a lake here, meaning it's kind of flipped around now. Um, there's also uh, a sea is a motif of defeat because the Red Sea was where God drowned the Egyptians who pursued Israel, and the Sea of Galilee was kind of tumultuous, So, and the pigs went there. So uh, it's a place of defeat. Uh, so yes, it's a physical region where people experience the refining love of God as torment. They've become addicted to something else and are not stable. A lake of fire suggests a contradiction. It's an inversion of the fire on Mount Sinai. People could climb out, but it seems that they're climbing down and climbing away, which is what C.S. Lewis's picture is when he says hell is in the midst of heaven. So it is, it's a weird thing, the, the more we think about it. The, the issue here, methodologically, I want to make a methodological point about how we read scripture. People make the mistake of reading only the passages where fire seems painful and ostensibly will is will be painful but that's a that's not the only place that fire is talked about what we uh should not do is break up a literary theme into pieces and draw conclusions based on those pieces alone so here are examples of how not to do that from acts in exa example number 1 tongues and the holy spirit so you could take the time where the, the occasions like in Acts 2 and 19, where the Holy Spirit comes and people speak in tongues. Now, uh, I am charismatic and not Pentecostal because the, the Spirit comes on people and doesn't cause pe people to speak in tongues sometimes. But if you only take the, the times where the Spirit does that, like causes people to speak in tongues, you would make a misleading conclusion. You'd be making a methodological mistake. Another example would be imprisonment in Acts. Do you read only the times when God breaks the apostles out of jail? Like, is that fair to say to believers in Saudi Arabia and Iran that, well, because there are instances that it's always going to happen? No, because there are plenty of times when God does not break people out of jail. So we can't make a comprehensive, we have to leave it open. And then uh, I'll leave this third example. You get the picture here. The, the issue is we have to start recognizing that fire begins positively. It's always, every time God uses it, it's always positive. It's his invitation to be refined and restored. Again, like precious metal being melted down. And yes, that does sound uncomfortable, but to have the dross scooped away, that might be worth it. And that is kind of what we're shooting for. And that's why John of Damascus 
I think I had you read him last. For what is hell but the deprivation of that which is exceedingly desired by someone? Therefore, according to the analogy of desire, whoever desires God rejoices, and whoever desires sin is punished. So, yeah, it is a consequence, but it's more like being at an addiction uh, an addiction treatment center and refusing to be treated for your addiction and saying, no, I, this is not a problem. So what hell is, is God saying, it is a problem. Please acknowledge it. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to insist that Jesus is the healing and the solution and the re redemption of your human nature. Please come to him. No, 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 no. And on and on forever. Dostoevsky said, what is hell? I maintain that it is the suffering of being unable to love. It's to look at other people and say, I hate how God is loving them. That's not fair. <laughs> like endless jealousy why can't i get what i want well because what you want is not good don't make that equivalence and as lewis says the gates of hell are locked on the inside so um the issue of deserving to desiring and thank you for your patience i know i'm keeping you a little long what is the emo emotional pathway to jesus in penal substitutionary atonement you go through survival emotions uh guilt and then anxiety like oh my gosh i've done wrong and god really is gonna abandon me destroy me lock me up and th and then jesus comes so okay i feel relief and then gratitude those are survival emotions it keeps people immature and you might also say that it trains people to uh almost love their oppressor right? Like, the, what's, what is it? The Stockholm effect, right? It, to fall in love with your tormentor uh, for those, those moments of mercy. But in medical substitutionary atonement, which is our phrase for it, <clears throat> or healing atonement, Jesus does a medicinal work in human nature that he, that no one else could do. And so he shares himself with us. It, we, we could address you know, the kind of the the pathway from guilt to innocence. It could. Uh, I mean, it was certainly, yeah, sure, that that uh, makes sense, but it's not necessarily so. and and especially, I don't think we focus on survival emotions because God does not threaten us. And so there in in healing atonement and restorative justice, there can be so many other desires that we've already mentioned, right? When people want they hope to become more loving and courageous. They, they want to actually respond to the solidarity that God has all already shown with us, that he has sorrow and grief for all creation. And we say, I want to enter into that, that we long for meaning and significance, that we admire and love Jesus. And we're impressed with the consistency of the biblical story. Those are emotional pathways. So what do we do? We discern good desires like Paul says, the conscience provokes good desires, right? We celebrate every in evidence of good desire in us or in other people, Romans 2, and anchor it in God because God made us to desire good things. We center Jesus because Jesus perfected human desire. That's what it means in he Hebrews 12. He is the author and perfecter of faith because faith perfects human nature and human desire. And we must participate in our own healing by Christ's humanity. Philippians has a major uh, role in this, the theme of partnership and participation. And our choices shape our desires. So in the same way that it's important for me as a man, if I've watched lots of porn or smoked crack or played excessive video games, there's an impact on my brain. The only way to heal from that is to engage in real relationship it uh and and to with and to resist the pull to the fantasy activities because i need healthier neural pathways our sh our choices shape our desires and so we don't merit or deserve salvation which is an individualistic framework anyway but we do participate in it which is relational and so um one of the fun things that i've done is craft a series of bible studies called shame and glory where we look at jesus's emotions and we say if jesus 
is the truly human one, then we're supposed we are being drawn towards him and his emotions have meaning for us. He wants to shape our emotions. So here are some emotions that he had, longing and joy, sorrow and anger when he wept by the tomb of Lazarus, lust, Jesus lusted. In, in Luke's account of the communion uh, story, he says, I lust to eat this with you in the kingdom. So he, he wants the, the close intimacy. That it, It's usually blunted in English. There's so many other emotions then that it's, it's his emotions dignifying our emotions. Yes, if, he assumes that we feel these things, but we, we also need to be shaped by him. Uh, and so our salvation, is, the salvation that we have, what is salvation in this paradigm? It's of our human nature. But it's of us, right? Something in us is saved. We are saved from the corruption of sin in Jesus, not from God. In a unity of towards a unity of words and life and resuming a journey towards more life from God. So it really is resuming into towards the tree of life and eating from it. The big question about human destiny then is just, do we desire Jesus, right? Do we desire him for ourselves, for others, more than we desire defining good and evil for ourselves, which is what eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil was. It's saying, I want to internalize this power for myself. I don't want God to have it. I want to have it. And yeah, that would be a problem. <laughs> so some passages that might rise to the top for you if you do ministry in this paradigm is... All the people encountering Jesus in the Gospels were, especially where Jesus says, what do you want? I mean, that's implicit. Jesus is tapping something in them. He is pulling something uh, uh, in them towards himself. And they're responding. Ephesians 4 talks about human desire. So does Romans 1. It's a touchy passage. Genesis 2 and 3. And then the Psalms talk about our identity, our desires, and our refinement. Also, we talked about the healing and transformation of the heart. There are different idioms for this, a circumcised heart, a cleansed new heart, a God-scripted heart, or a heart with God's writing on it, and an enlarged heart. Is it possible to, to not desire Jesus? Yeah, it is. It's like desiring the dross that God wants to burn away and scoop away. And in that case, then God's refining healing power feels like destroying power. And that's why I showed like that, well, there's positive refining fire over here. It could feel like a destroying fire, like you're burning the house that I built. But <clears throat> that's not how God intended or intends for us to feel. So it that moves us from the, the whole category of deserving, like what did we deserve? What does God deserve over to desiring? What do we desire? And that frees us to work with what people show us about why they come to us, why, they, why they're interested in Jesus. They desire all these good things because God made them in his image. Of course, they desire good things. We just need to say, and Jesus perfected our desires. That's why we need him. All right, so why do we think God is more retributive than restorative? because we're Protestant, and because the church, the Catholic church, was influenced by Latin ideas of merit and demerit. The Protestant reformers just kind of continued to take that in. Was Jesus the victim of God's retributive justice? No, he was the agent of God's restorative justice. He was active, not passive. And is divine fire God's intention to harm us? No, God's fire is God's intention to purify us. Hell is the resistance to God's purification. But if if that's so, then hell is also the love of God. So yeah, we could say to people, God loves you and will always love you. All right, that is it for me. Marco, can I bring something here? The burning away and the purification process. I was wrestling with the idea of burning away a part of the self that that idea of purification it sounds um 
uh, threatening, actually. When I think about purification and burning and think about it as a cancer, if I put, if I give my, tell myself that interpretation, well, to get rid of cancer, you're burning, you're cutting, you're poisoning. And so then it makes sense, but I don't know if that lines up with what the text would tell us. It absolutely does. Yes. Okay. Um, the place I would go to demonstrate that uh, is Romans 7, 14 through 25, where Paul explains what impact the it was uh, on him as a Jewish person to live under the Sinai covenant mm -hmm. and develop the diagnosis mm -hmm. and clarity. And there he says, there is this I myself and there is the sin which indwells me, right? And so he's able to distinguish between the self God created mm -hmm. and then either this parasite thing or a cancer thing or a disorder or something in me mm -hmm. or a mode mm -hmm. of existence in which I mm -hmm. sometimes am that um, needs to be cut away. He calls mm -hmm. that the flesh. The, the reason why that's so significant is the flesh is the term used for what is circumcised away. Mm. It's the flesh. Mm. And, and so where, where people really need the clarity that, that we say there is a true self and then mm. there's kind of something else that has become part of us that, that is a disease. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that is why the, the surgical scalpel, you know, like that, that image comes in the, and the fire enters in. Mm -hmm. um, an, another way to see that is in the, the, the offering of the sin offering in Leviticus, because yes, the animal is, uh, the, the sheep or goat or whatever is, um, is killed, but what is burned are the waste organs, the kidney, the liver, the intestines, right? Because those are the the organs that excrete toxins from the body. Okay. And I know this comes up, right? Like, wait, would they have really known that? Yeah, they. I I think so. They yeah. would have. Yeah. Uh, though, and those are the things that are burned on the altar that give a pleasing aroma to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. it's the stuff that is toxic in us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So. I hope that helps, but it I would absolutely so affirm what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. No, it helps so much, Marco. Thank you. I saw some questions in the chat about working with um, offenders or the people who cause harm, and uh, that's a real passion area of mine, but there's a lot that could be said, but I want to say one thing that about the practice of restorative justice. It um, One of the tenets of this philosophy of restorative justice is that it has to be voluntary. So if a person that has caused harm is not taking accountability or willing to say, um, I have some responsibility in this, then we don't proceed with restorative practices with that person. So um, to the people who wrote that question, maybe another time we can go into more on how that looks, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of ways to involve the person who caused harm or to help them understand that they um, impacted others with their actions uh, by doing panels where you bring in surrogate victims or even with direct um, dialogue between the harmed party and the people who caused the harm. Um, also with the John schools, they do similar things, um, but really for it to be truly restorative, the people need to enter voluntarily. So it being court mandated or somebody being tricked into it, um, you know, isn't, isn't gonna be truly restorative for anyone involved, especially the person who's been harmed. Because if you know that the person who harmed you is there voluntarily because they care, um, then you're gonna feel a lot more uh, healing than if the person was mandated or gets a reduced sentence for showing up to whatever the punishment is. Uh, restorative justice should not be a punishment. So it, there's a lot of parallels to the way that um, Mako's teaching about God and how he offers 
uh, and pursues, but he doesn't force. Um, and, you know, restorative justice when done uh, correctly <laughs> uh, should be truly voluntary. There's other tenants too, but that one has a lot of parallels to what we're talking about tonight that I wanted to throw out there. Thank you, Samantha. In many ways, um, on a personal level, when we're talking about our relationship with Jesus, uh, I, I think, and Jesus healing, offering us the the restoration of our own human human nature, we are both. It seems like we're both offender and victim, right? Like, they're, they're, and and so our partnership in restoring ourselves with Jesus is important. It must be voluntary. Um, and, and that's where the circumcision of the heart and the, the, having a new heart or healed heart or things like that come into play is, um, well, God doesn't magically just do that. He calls us to partner with him. Um, and then the outworking of that is as, as we seek to restore relationships where we have done harm, um, or address issues at places where we have been harmed it is a continued outworking of that on the, the next layer. Thank you again for spending this time together. Really appreciate it. We'll see you next time where we'll, we'll again look at kind of uh, some more practical, uh, out, outward, um, larger societal issues, I think, G going back to... Um, restorative justice in a criminal justice paradigm, but also in a, a larger uh, paradigm economically, ecologically um, between men and women and, and touch on a few things there. So I look forward to doing that and um, being with you again.